Today. There's a concept we've been looking at, and that is the idea of this King Jesus, that he is king of everything, but his kingdom is a very different kind of kingdom. He is a servant king, and I, I know those terms almost don't go together. Uh, the idea of being a servant king just doesn't seem to match. It doesn't seem to fit. It seems like, well, what in the world? That, that doesn't make sense. In Matthew chapter 20, I want you to see the story. It says, The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Say to these two sons of mine, Are to sit one on the right and one on the left one on your right hand and one on your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, "Do you not know you do not know what you are asking? Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink?" And they said to him, "We are able." And he said to them, "You will drink the cup, but to sit at the right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father." And then the ten heard it. They were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall, be, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, it's always great when your mom sticks up for you, isn't it? Don't you love that? Yeah, not so much anymore. Because by the time you get a little bit older, you don't want your mom sticking up for you. It might have been good when you were a little kid and, and she would kind of take over and, and prepare. And, and whatever was happening, she would protect you and she would... You know, make sure that uh, things worked out right for you. But once you get a little bit older, it's not so good to have mom in there. Uh, but mom comes, the mother of James and John, and she asks for positions of honor. Can my two boys sit? I mean, somebody's got to sit on the right and left hand. And by that, he means the places of honor, the best place next to the king. And it's in your kingdom. So they're recognizing that Jesus is king. And so in this new kingdom, put these two, my sons, on either side so that they are the ones closest to the throne. That they are the ones who are there because they are the ones who also have this power. Well, okay. Jesus says, I don't think you know what you're asking. He says, are you able to drink the cup? And by this, he means the cup of suffering, because it's not going to be an easy time just getting to this position of being first in the kingdom. Jesus knows what's coming. The others do not. And of course, they volunteer. Oh, yes, whatever it takes, whatever we have to drink to, you know, be the next in line to the throne or be right next to the throne to be the one with power. And of course, we're willing to do that. And Jesus assures them that, okay, you will, but it's still not mine to give. It has been prepared for someone, but it has not been sent to me to give that privilege. There will be someone who sits on the right, and there will be someone who sits on the left, but that's not up to Jesus to give. And he says, you need to understand what this is about. The ten, hearing this, they become very upset, indignant, maybe because they didn't think to ask first. And so they're a little bit unsure about this. Why do they think they're supposed to sit in the right and left hand? And as you look through the Gospels, you see the place where they have been arguing all of this time about who's the greatest and who's not the greatest. And I don't know how you win an argument like that anyway. Uh, how do you make yourself the greatest? But I think that kind of argument goes on all the time. I'm better than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm prettier than you. And it doesn't matter which place it is. It's always we're better at sports. We're better at something. And it seems to be one of those things that's just kind of human nature. It has to do with the way we feel about authority. 
And so he says the Gentiles rule over everyone else. And so the king would be at the top and then the king would have a first servant under him and that servant's over everything else. And then more under him and more under him so that there, it forms this hierarchy. But you can recognize there's one person at the top. And that one person at the top is, is going to be king. And of course you get more authority, more power, better place, with all the rest of it as you go down. So you can be the boss over the workers. You can be the king over the subjects. And he says, it is not going to be like this among you. Whoever wants to be great has to be the servant, has to be the slave. And he says, the son of man. And so he turns to himself and he says, here's my example. The son of man came to serve. To give his life. I'm the king of a new kingdom, but I didn't come for other people to serve me. I came to be able to serve them. And so he talks about this idea as being a great servant. A servant of one person. A servant of God. And I think that's the only way we can look at this. Is that he's talking about himself as being this servant of God. And so that's who the person is that he's going to serve. And he's going to do whatever God wants. This is kind of the first time it comes up in this reference as far as these places of honor and being given away or being part of this. And so Jesus is a king. He acts like a king. And I want you to realize that sometimes I think we mistake this. Sometimes we might see this as well. Then Jesus is servant of everybody. Uh, is not saying he's servant of everybody. Because Jesus acts like a king all the way through. He acts like a king in everything. He is a servant of God. But he is able to heal people who ask. He is able to teach people who need knowledge. He argues with the Jewish rulers. Can you be a servant and argue? He does submit to them. He does recognize their authority, but he also teaches against the way that they practice. He opposes them when they stand against him. He heals on the Sabbath day. He cleared the temple. He stops the corruption that is going on in there, which seems to be directly against them. He is servant of God, but he is not servant of the Pharisees. He is not a servant to do laundry and take out trash. He is a servant to do good for people. But he's not a servant of every person in the world. And yet what he did was for the benefit of every person in the world. So in that sense, he does serve every person in the world. But it doesn't mean that every person in the world tells him what to do. And I think, I think sometimes we get that idea that, well, if I'm a servant, then everybody tells me what to do. Nobody was telling Jesus what to do. Jesus is a servant king. And of course, that's what we need to realize. And so he did what was good to benefit everyone. And so this is about leadership. It's about places of honor. And Jesus has a very different idea. Well, when you look at the first king of Israel, they did not have kings at the beginning. They had judges when they needed deliverance. The first king of Israel was about to be chosen because the people had come to Samuel and said, your sons are not good to be judges over us, and we want a king. We want to be like everybody else around us. And Samuel tries to warn them, and God tells Samuel, I want you to warn people what it's going to be like. And so look with me at 1 Samuel 8 and some of the things he says. Here's what a king would be like. And this comes from God as to what kings are supposed to do or what normal kingship would be. Is that right? So in 1 Samuel 11, he said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifty and some to plow his ground and some to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots and he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. 
And he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and he will give it to his officers, to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and he will put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves." And they wanted this? Absolutely they wanted it. Then we'll be like everybody else. And you look at the passage and it's amazing. He's going to take, in every single sense, he will take and they will do his. He will take your land to be his or for his servants. He will take, and every single one of these is about who he takes for himself. A king is going to be selfish. He's going to take all the best crops. A king is going to be expensive. There's not, he's not like going to be a servant. He's going to be served by everybody else. And so he says, he'll take your sons to drive his chariots to be his commanders, to plow his field, to reap his harvest, to make his implements of war and equipment and chariots and daughters are going to be the servants, the perfumers, the cooks. Then he's going to take everything that you own, your fields, your vineyards, your orchards, a tenth of your grain. He'll take your servants, he'll take your young men, he'll take your donkeys, he'll take a tenth a tenth of the flocks, and you will be slaves. That's the normal king. And that's what we see throughout the Bible. That's what we see throughout history, is that's usually the way kings operate. Have you ever seen a poor king? A king who, you know, can't quite afford to go to McDonald's. He's having to save up money. No, he's the king. He, he has everything. He has armies at his disposal. And still, they want a king. They want a king who's going to be a rich. They want a king who has all authority. And if you don't like the king and you say something against the king, the king can put you to death for it. It happens a lot. The king has every influence. If the king does evil, then the nation does evil. If the king does good, then the nation can do well. If the king worships idols, then everyone worships idols. See, people are usually in this life for themselves. They look for their advantage. They look for what they can get away with. And sometimes that becomes their motto. What I live for is for what I can get away with. Others can help them. We don't want to give up our time. We don't want to give up our comfort. We do what's right and fair for us. After all, we should be first. And Jesus comes to say, I am not that kind of a king. I am not going to be a king like that. It's a paradox that he's a king, that he would make this so very different. And I think Paul puts it best in Philippians 2 when he describes this as what Jesus did. He says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he says, don't look out for your own interest. Have the mind of Christ. Look for how Jesus did it. And the way Jesus did it was to give up. He had a certain place. Well, the place is called God. I, I mean, isn't that amazing? How would you 
think of it, if you were God and you say, well, I'll take a little step back. Well, what step back can you take from being God? It's not a little step. It's a huge step. What he says is, I would become human. He emptied himself to become a servant. And he started from the very beginning at the least possible powerful position. That's the power of a baby, although a baby seems to wield great influence on those people around it, especially when it begins to scream and holler and all of those things. But uh, that's just one of those things. It doesn't really have any power. It can't make any decisions. And he's humbled to human form, to the form of a servant, to this earth, and he's obedient, obedient to the point of death on a cross. So what does it mean to obey God? Well, it also tells us he learned obedience in what he suffered. It means he surrendered his life. It means he died on a cross for us. He died to be the sacrifice for our sin. He was in human form, and he didn't hold on to being God. So, would you give up being rich for somebody else? Uh, most of the time, if you've worked hard enough to be rich, you don't just want to give it all away and say, well, yeah, I'll just give up being rich. In fact, there's a story in Jesus encounters with people of a rich young ruler, and he decides, no, I, I can't give up being rich. Jesus says, I gave up more than that. Would you give up being pretty? I mean, all of you look great in those masks, right? Would you give up being pretty? Would you give up being popular? Would you give up being liked by people? Would you give up being smart? I know we're quite a ways back down from being God, but would you just be stupid for God and give it up and say, it doesn't matter if I'm smart? Would we give up the place of God if we could ever imagine such a place? You could still be God, but you get none of the privileges. You could serve and help other people and suffer. And then you could be God. And he did nothing wrong and he lived a perfect life for us. And therefore, God has highly exalted him. The name above all names that every knee should bow, that every tongue should confess, Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Honor and glory come from the Father. That he is above every name that there is. And God gives him that kind of glory because of what he did and because of how he did it. It is such a different way. Because a lot of times when you look at the kings, they either got old enough to die and pass it on to a son. Or more commonly, it happens by assassination. That's really how you give up something is by assassination, right? Well, no. He says, I'm going to give it up because I choose it. Because it's going to be a way that I can give something for you and I can do something better for you. And his kingdom is like that. He has all authority, but he values humility. And he wants people in his kingdom to be like him. He calls them disciples, to be followers, to lead by example, not by edict. Jesus is a king who takes the place of a servant. He's not a proud king who is unable to suffer for others. And he asks all of his, his subjects to be servants also. And when he does, this is an amazing kingdom. And that's where we are today. Isn't that how church works? That's exactly how it is supposed to work. Church is supposed to be exactly like this. We have elders who are shepherds, not bosses. 
They are the ones who care for people. They are the ones who are concerned for people. They are the ones who are able to do things for people. We have ministers who are able to serve among other people. We have ministries and people who have taken those on that they might be servants. We have one master. That one master is God. He says we cannot serve two masters. And if you think about it, this one simple concept solves so many things. It forms limitations, sure. We can't take on any more than one master. Now, I understand you can do other things. It's not like you can't do anything else in your life. But nothing else can be master. This is the one thing that God is master above anything else. And so we choose to serve God and to be his people first and to put Jesus as the king of our life. So how does that work? Well, in Colossians chapter 3, he talks about some things here. Again, Paul is describing how this change occurs. He says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you so that you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I like that last line where it just kind of wraps everything up. So he says, we put away some things, and he's describing the process more now. When you take Jesus as king, he describes this process. It means there's a lot of other stuff you got to get rid of. He says, we put away the selfishness, which usually is the source of the anger. So you put away reasons to be angry and hateful. And you put away wrath and malice and slander. And you be careful how you talk. You don't want to say the wrong thing. And some conversations actually need to stop because they are not kind. Can you say what's true? Very carefully. I'm going to try and do that this morning, but I understand I may not make it. A lot of our world has become very ugly. It does not look Christian. A lot of times we're saying things about each other. Is it easier if we're wearing a mask? Should we wear a mask? Should we not wear a mask? You know, those masked people, those non-masked people... And it just goes back and forth, and it seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger. We want to judge someone's motives, and we want to judge someone's intelligence, and we want to criticize. We realize our world is not normal now. Our world wasn't normal before. And it wasn't good before. Because there was a whole lot of things. This just is one more issue to bring into it all, to try and divide over and to try and make it a problem. And when you really look at it, the one thing that matters is Jesus is king. That's the only thing. He says, don't lie. Not by words, not by actions. Don't leave wrong impressions. And it's kind of hard to know what the truth is right now. I'm not sure if I could say on everything what it is, what works. Are people dying all around us? Is it as bad as some people say? Is it really nothing? The main thing is we act like Jesus. However you see it, do what you need. Be safe. Please do not criticize or be hateful to other people. Because we are just servants of Jesus. That's all. That's first. And the anger and the negativity usually come from selfishness because I want it to be a certain way. 
I want to get what I want, and I want it to turn out like I think. And that's because we think we're most important. After all, if we could just be God, it'd solve a lot of things, right? But then if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, we would give up being God. Even when we do know what everything is, and we do know what's best, and we would be able to say it, and we would have people ignore us and do whatever they wanted. He says, we put off the old self. It's been corrupted. It means you die to yourself. It means you leave old ways, and it's really hard to do. It means you leave all of the anger, all of the resentment, all of the hurt, all of the bitterness, all of the things that have been done to you, all of the past. Being right does not make it better. It just doesn't. Being wrong doesn't make it any better either. He says, what I want you to do after you've put off the old self, because you can see it, it's being corrupted, it is falling away, is that you put on a new self, still being renewed to the likeness of God. I saw this, you can't be who you're going to be and who you used to be at the same time. Somewhere we have to be able to be something different, someone new. We are still being renewed by God. And as we put off this old self and die to this old self, that's called repentance. And as we put on the new self, it happens in baptism, but it happens in your heart. It happens when you change. It happens when you do something different. When you die to yourself and claim there's only one king. That's all there is. And I don't accept any other authority but Him. We're renewed to a new knowledge. We're renewed to a new kingdom. And He says there's no barriers. There's no agenda. There's no race. There's no gender. None of those things are what we divide over. Because we have one King. And He even makes the list. There's not Jews and Greeks. It's Okay, for a long time, Jews were the favored race. He says, we don't have that anymore. The Jewish race is not better. There's not circumcised or uncircumcised. Those were Old Testament covenant people. And as you made that old covenant, you would think, well, wouldn't that be a huge advantage? And some of them claimed it was this great advantage. To be a Jewish Christian, that was so much better. But that's their arguments, and we don't notice that one as much, but that one was so volatile back in its time. Just the same as some of ours are volatile on our time. And there's not different cultures, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. He says Christ is all. And that's it. Christ is all. Christ is in all. And yeah, there's been a lot of injustice done, a lot by barbarians, a lot by Scythians, but we don't, you know, see them. Nobody has a tattoo Scythian, just doesn't happen, but they had exactly the same thing. They had the same world, and every person struggles with this. Every person has had injustice done to them at some time. And that's why your mama always stuck up for you, right? Isn't that where we started in this whole story? She would go fix them and she would make it right. And No. You see, what we're left with is Jesus' life matters. And yes, there's been a lot of things that are unjust. And yes, there's been a lot of things that are not good. And there is a horrible, sinful world that gets so angry and it corrupts itself. But there's nothing to divide us because we live for a different king. And so we have one king, and that's Jesus All other labels are not as important as his kingdom. We can all be one in Christ. All be one in his kingdom. 
We are God's chosen, holy, beloved people. All of us. And everybody fits together in that. And so he tells us, I want you to put on compassionate hearts and kindness and humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, putting up with each other. Does he know what he's asking? I mean, that is a lot to put up with. Okay, I know you're having to put up with me too. So that's really what happens for us is putting up with each other. And he says, yeah, that's what I want because that's what Jesus did. He was able to put up with people. If you have any complaints, be forgiving. I want to tell somebody my complaint though, right? Who can I tell? Well, you can tell God. He listens to all complaints. And then he points you straight to Jesus who says, I am the one who builds everything together in perfect harmony. Above all this, put on love that binds everything together in perfect harmony. Sounds really nice, doesn't it? It's the hard part, is the working it out. Does it happen? Yeah. One person at a time. One person at a time. That's how it works. So let me pull this together. First, take Jesus as your king and follow him. That's really what we have to do. He is the one who's first. Be willing to do what he did. Be able, willing to give up advantages, rights, privileges, hurts, gripes, everything because Jesus is king. That's first. Complaints, prejudices, don't hold on to your old identity even. I need a new identity. The new identity is to be Christian. There is only one Jesus. He says, put off the old. Put off every reason you had for being angry. That one's hard. Not just the anger you felt, but every reason you had for being angry. And there are a lot of really legitimate ones. But when you accept there's only one king, and that's the most important thing in life, then that's what makes all the difference. And you put on a new self with compassion and kindness, and you choose to see people in a different light than you've ever seen them before. Because you know how you look with the eyes of Jesus and you see differently. And you see that some of them are afraid and worried and trying. And so they might strike out with anger or frustration. And we learn how to forgive like we've been forgiven. No one can make up for the past. We have to let it go. Isn't that what you hope Jesus will do? That he will let it go. And all of that past is gone. The only way is to go forward. And we may have to admit some of that past stuff is ours. And it's bad. And it's really not good. And we need forgiveness. And we need to focus on Jesus. And it's why he came. Love binds everything together in perfect harmony. Saw this also. We rule with the heart of a servant, and we serve with the heart of a king. So we show the love of Jesus, and we allow it to bind us to other people, to bring love which binds everything together. And then we trust in God to work it out. Because we really do need some divine intervention in this. And that is that God is going to work all of this out. Because Jesus is king. And if he's king in your life, it's going to make a huge difference. Today, if you haven't done any of these things, you need to put off whatever the old is and put on the new and be able to learn to forgive like you've been forgiven. And get rid of the source of the anger and let Jesus be king. Thank you for watching our video. We have a lot more content here on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to get the latest notifications when we have new material come out, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.